is the illegal <coughs> illegal transportation of human. Yeah, in like. Um, I guess it would just be. Well, you know, I. It's, it's kind of a tough question to answer. Probably. Um, it would be like not slavery, I guess exactly, but taking people and selling them, I guess, would be more or less hype. So it kind of is like slavery. Human trafficking is when people take other people and then like, tra like transport them, usually for as slavery or something like that. Usually, I, I'm from the Southwest, so I know it happens a lot across the U.S.-Mexico border. There's a lot of human trafficking that happens. Also. Um, I know that it's a big problem in the Asian countries, and um, it, I'm not sh quite sure on uh, how it is like in uh, like in America, but I know that it's um, it's a big problem, and, uh, and I'm not sure on. Um, like what people are doing anything about when people get taken with without uh, it being their own will and they are used as slaves for I don't know many other stuff um, I know that it still happens a lot something like 27 million from a few flyers and uh, people trying to organize some I don't know protest or meeting about it I heard the figure 27 million yeah I just, I just know it's still going around and there's a lot of it. It's just gotten sneakier since people started calling people out or something like that. Apparently there are more today than there ever have been. Do um, you need a table there? Oh, no. I don't understand much of it. When I think of it, I think that it's like a very foreign problem and I don't think it happens here. I know that people are imported to here. I don't think yeah. people are exported. exported. Is that they're being moved in and out of countries, young girls, sometimes like 13, 14. Um, I know that there are millions of people trafficked every year um, and it's not just an international problem that happens in the United States also. And they're trafficked for different reasons. Some are internationally, some are domestically. Um, a lot of the times it's sex workers. Well, and a lot of times, you know, if they're free, they go back to wherever they were trafficked, wherever they were rescued from, because they're financially dependent or like dependent on drugs that they've been given, like forced and everything. Sometimes it's young girls' families that release them into the into that world in order for money. From what I think, sex slavery. It happens in less developed all over the world, you know, some people stereotype it to one region or the other, but that's not the case. Most of the time, you know, statistic-wise, people assume it's just female and children, but it happens to males as well, and that's something that we need to, you know, get out there by spreading awareness. Well, um, from the movie that I watched on Lifetime, I basically learned that it happens in a lot of countries. I think that it, uh, a lot of people who are like kind of affected by it are immigrants who come here um, because people don't may not know who they are, so they don't have family members. So there are people who know that they're here to like look after them. I think it can also happen um, among a lot of younger girls who are exploited by men um, who uh, just take advantage of them, and it could be prostitution. I think it can be any form of uh, that business. <laughs> but yeah, that's basically. Well, I think a lot of people think that human trafficking is just about sex, but recently I've been figuring out that human trafficking is more than just sex, it's all types of labor. Yeah, and it's definitely a lot of people don't realize how big of an issue it is here in the U.S. They think, of, oh, it's a third world problem, but we definitely know it's present here in the U.S. I have no understanding of human trafficking. Okay. Just more awareness in the school, more education to the students, um, talks, I guess bringing people in to educate us about. Uh, I feel people who have been forced to, um, who have been captured from their homes, who've been taken away forcefully and forced to do things like um, that they would not normally agree to do, or uh, force them to do jobs that are illegal, or um, probably sexually assault them, or um, mistreat. There's currently a lot of people um, suffering from modern day slavery which could be in many forms, like sex trafficking, um, or even nannies being trapped in houses. Oh, right, right now, human, tra human trafficking, I think of sex, uh, like tra sex trafficking, sex trafficking, mm -hmm. sex trafficking um, 
and, that's and it was kind of sad that, never mind, um, what can I say about sex trafficking? I don't know why. Yeah, I know that it's very prevalent right now. Um, I know that it involves not just um, like sex slaves, but also like domestic slaves as well. But that it does happen in the United States too, probably a lot more than most people. Think. And that it's um, generally against women mainly. Um, I know that men go through it as well. Um, next year I'm in SSIR with Dr. Data, Human Rights and Modern Day Slavery, so I'm sure we'll be talking a lot about that. And um, I understand that it's a severe issue that that's really on the rise now. Um, and that is something that needs to be stopped. I first became aware of human trafficking when I was in ninth grade in high school. And um, someone came to my church and started talking about the fact that little girls were being sold as prostitutes. And I was just really shocked. Um, and it made me think of my little sister because at that time, the average age was between 11 and 14 for a child prostitute, and my sister was 11. Um, and I just kind of started thinking about, wow, like, all of these kids, all of these people are someone's sister, someone's brother, someone's best friend. Um, and maybe the person who loves them can't help them. But I've been given so many resources and just abilities and just being uh, born into a country where like, we actually get to change things and change laws. Um, and so that kind of propelled me into this. And then when I came to Richmond, um, I mean, I was like, yes, stop. And, yes. Um, for me, I actually hadn't learned about human trafficking or even really heard the term until I got into college. And I knew oppression happened and like people didn't have the same rights that we did and all this gender inequality and all that happened, but I didn't know that people were being sold as commodities and being used for profit, their bodies or their work without, you know, enslaved conditions. And so as soon as I learned about it, I went to a couple of stops, documentary showings and actually watched documentaries about real women and men and children who have been trapped in human slavery and I, it really grabbed my attention that this stuff exists while I'm living in luxury and honestly I've been blessed and given so much in life that I, I couldn't really plead ignorance after I learned about it and I couldn't just sit idly and know that this exists without me doing anything so I got involved with STOP and since then I've been attending documentary showings, um, lobby days to lobby our um, committee at Virginia, the Virginia State Governor, um, just stuff like that just to make a little bit of a difference as much as I can, at least while I'm here. So on campus we've been showing a couple documentaries. We showed Nefarious at the beginning of the year and then we also showed another film called Sex and Money. Um, and then we just had our 27 hour stand where we occupied the forum. For most of the 27 hours, there was some thunder and lightning, uh, so it kind of packed up for a little bit. But um, we occupied the forum and had people take photos with different signs to raise awareness. We handed out materials and then showed two other short documentaries in the evening. We had some performances during that time where, um, like, off the cuff volunteered an embodied dance group and a couple of our friends who play the violin or sing, and they they attracted more people to the event, so more people came and hung out, and it was kind of more of a presence in the forum to attract more and more people to come and see, like, why are you guys out here? What are you doing? What do these X's stand for? So, just like a little bit of awareness and education a little bit once we hand out like the materials and talk about the stats. It's, it's always shocking, I think, for people to hear mm -hmm. for the very first time, so that was cool. Um, there are several things that I would say people on this campus need to know more about when it comes to human trafficking. Although the first level is that they need to know that slavery still exists and that it didn't end with the Emancipation Proclamation 150 years ago. That's the first step. The second step is showing people what slavery looks like today. The biggest thing with that is for them to know it's not just sex trafficking. Sex trafficking is a horrific issue, but there's also labor trafficking that occurs in this country and in this state. So it's important for students on this campus to know that trafficking occurs within homes, within um, factories, on farms, in restaurants, in hotels, across all these different spectrums with the common denominator of forced labor of some sort for the purpose of exploitation with a third party profiting and also being involved with forced fraud and coercion as the means to keep that individual trapped in that situation. So 
First, people need that basic level understanding of what slavery exists and that it happens in many different areas. The second thing, or maybe this is the third thing they need to know, is that this also happens in Richmond. It is not just something that happens overseas in Thailand or India when we go abroad to see. This is something that happens in Richmond. Within the Henrico County, which is just surrounding U of R, um, in a span of 22 months, there were seven domestic minor sex trafficking cases here. And six of those seven girls came from outside of the state and had been trafficked into this Henrico County. That's not even including the Richmond City or Chesterfield or Midlothian or any of the other surrounding areas in Richmond. So students need to know this is a reality right where we go to school. And I think that has implications for students in terms of how they conceptualize the issue and, and it's very important so that they don't create a distance between themselves and the issue as being something that's international. So those would be the major areas where I think that students really need to understand what human trafficking looks like. I would definitely say to begin by educating yourself so you know the facts, you know what's happening, um, because it's not just an international issue, but once you know the stats of like what's happening in your area and in your backyard, the facts become more real, they become a little bit more tangible, um, and people respond better to that. So as far as learning like what's actually going on around you and making it personal, um, I'd say that's the first step. Um, also, I think it actually is really important to move beyond awareness to action um, because we kind of have an activist culture in America that is a lot about awareness and awareness is great because if you're not aware of what the issue is, there's no way you can counteract it. Um, but I think especially with something as horrible as human trafficking, a lot of people just don't want to think about it anymore and do anything more than that. I had one guy tell me, he's like, this is so horrible, I just don't want to think about it. And that's why I don't do anything about it. Um, and so I think taking that first step of action, and there are um, four ways actually in Richmond that people can tangibly get involved. One is Richmond Justice Initiative. Um, and volunteering with them, people can like, lobby lawmakers and do education and awareness activities. Another is the Great Haven Project, and they work with survivors from the city of Richmond or people who've been trafficked to the city of Richmond. Um, and they're great if you want to do aftercare kind of stuff. And then Youth Life and uh, Chat are two mentoring programs in the city of Richmond. And actually, mentoring an at risk youth is a really, really great way to help prevent them from being trafficked. And Joe, you actually worked with RJI. Yeah. I worked with the Richmond Justice Initiative and basically they host a bunch of different awareness events because, like Bethany said, if people aren't aware that the issue even exists, then they obviously can't do anything to change it. They won't take an action step because they're not aware. Um, so we do a lot of awareness events, but also fundraising events um, to raise money for RJI and other um, organizations that combat human trafficking. Um, and the Richmond Justice Initiative has this thing called the Prevention Project, which is a curriculum that they just launched recently that goes into high schools. And it's for 10 weeks, students can attend and learn about um, what the profile of a pimp is like, how to avoid themselves getting trafficking, like what to do to help vulnerable persons, whether it's themselves, whether it's their friends or peers, basically warning signs of like what a trafficker can be, what human trafficking is, how to say no, um, yeah, those kind of things. So. The Richmond Justice Initiative does a lot with like educating locally, um, like she said, lobbying um, the Virginia state government, things like that. But there are other organizations that do things like aftercare and restoration work and the actual like litigation and prosecution, that kind of thing. Um, so there's there's a lot of different organizations that people can tap into and add their gifts and resources and time to. You just you gotta, you gotta look for them. There's already people doing this work, so to just get on board with them would yeah. probably be a really great place to start. That's perfect. Thank you guys very much. When I think back on my experience here at U of R, my one piece of advice for students who are interested in studying the issue of human trafficking is take advantage of all the resources that are available to you here at U of R. 
U of R has a bountiful amount of opportunities for us in terms of internships during the summer, um, getting connected with the State Department in DC, or a nonprofit that's focused on fighting anti-trafficking on the West Coast, or whether that's overseas. U of R has so many different connections, and we also have the funds through things like the Spider Internship Fund and other grants through the CCE that make um, taking those internships, which provide tangible experiences and practical um, knowledge in the field, and it makes it possible for our students, which is just such an awesome opportunity. And the other amazing thing is we have faculty who are willing to support us in studying this issue and learning about what it really means to have effective and sustainable methods of fighting human trafficking. So definitely partner up with professors to do research while you're here on campus and really um, be grateful for the awesome support that they can provide you as an undergraduate student to be able to do this type of research. We all have a lot of privileges here. I think it's like less than 1% of the world as a total will graduate from a four-year college. We have so many resources. You are has so many resources. Each individual student here has so many gifts and abilities. That's why you're here. And I would encourage you to use them to make it not about the huge statistic, to not make it about the fashionability of you know, having a cause, but to actually make it about that one person and helping one individual. And I think it was Mother Teresa who said, if you can't feed a million, feed one. So if you can't rescue a million people, work to free one person. Work to prevent one person from being trafficked. Work to make one law happen. And actually just do something, because you really can. I'm involved with an on-campus organization called STOP, Students Stopping the Trafficking of People, which was originally founded by two WILL members about five years ago, and then it was reactivated three years ago by myself and a few other WILL students during a GAP project. The purpose of STOP on campus is to raise awareness among students that modern-day slavery still exists, and then to give them tangible action steps for them to take their new awareness and move then into informed action. This happens through a variety of activities and they're different every year. Uh, this year we had one thing in the past fall, we showed a documentary on campus and we also had a woman who stood in the window of the bookstore and had tags on that said for sale and people walking by would see them and they stood where usually the mannequins stand. So people were very shocked and like from that shock they could turn and we had a table there with information about stop and different ways for students to get involved on campus and off campus. And so that's one example of an awareness tool that we use to start conversations. Another example is the Stand for Freedom campaign happening right now. And off campus, I'm involved with a group called Richmond Justice Initiative. Richmond Justice Initiative is a local anti-trafficking group whose mission is to provide communities with the tools necessary to be a force in the movement to end modern day slavery. They've been around since 2009. Yeah. 2009, and the founder is Sarah Lynn Pomeroy. Their five areas of focus are advocacy, which would be legislative lobbying, especially during the general session here in Virginia, awareness, which is the basic community mobilization, getting communities to care about human trafficking and know how to respond. Then they have education, which includes trainings for different backgrounds, people in social work, people in the medical field, and prevention, which is the biggest and growing, most quickly growing area for RJI and that involves going into local middle schools and high schools with an anti-trafficking curriculum to educate students about how not to become a victim of trafficking but also to empower them to become modern day abolitionists. And the fifth area is church mobilization so they work with various faith communities in Richmond to build support for the anti-trafficking movement. Over the past four years here at U of R, I've seen various different awareness events around the issue of human trafficking. And it's been very exciting to see the growing activism on campus amongst the faculty and the students, kind of collaborating around human rights in general and then also particularly human trafficking. I think one of the most effective things when it comes to awareness on campus is to give students a tangible action step. I think it's difficult sometimes for students to learn about the issue of human trafficking because when they first hear about it, sometimes they're so overwhelmed by the issue and the statistics being so big that it's almost paralyzing. So I think the, the key thing in a successful awareness event is that you 
do educate people about the realities of human trafficking, but then you also give them that next action step. And that enables them to move from a place of emotional response into action. And I think that one great example of that um, over the past few years is when we, I think it was my sophomore year, we did an awareness event on campus similar to one of the things in the bookstore and students could sign up to then go lobby on the Capitol here in Richmond. So that was a very tangible action step from learning about the issue to then receiving more training from STOP to be able to go speak to legislators about changing the laws within Virginia to make sure that it's more anti-trafficking safe here in Virginia. So I'd say that's one example thing that's worked well. Overall, I would say another big thing of awareness is giving people an action step and also understanding the school schedules of U of R students. So U of R students are very busy and are all over the place, so you have to figure out what works for them and their time schedules and then um, really adapt your awareness methods to that. So using social media is incredibly important and also working in times of day when people are passing through the comments in between classes is really great and timing documentaries during times of the year when students are not stressed with finals or midterms. So those are just some small technical things. Without a doubt, it involves the forced coercion of one individual using another individual, typically for economic gain, to the extent that that individual has no ability to get out on his or her own will or own capacity. Once I was in Japan and I passed by one of the, the local red light districts in the city of Fukuoka and I saw how integrated it was between organized crime and the police and how corruption explains so much of how people are being bought and sold across the world today. And that really opened up my, my mind's eye, my imagination in trying to understand not just trafficking in Japan, but all throughout East Asia, throughout the United States. And so now I've got this lens in my mind that whenever I think about human trafficking, I'm trying to be as aware as I can with regard to different types of trafficking, whether it's sex trafficking or child labor or forced labor or forced marriage. And wherever I go, even if it's here in Richmond, Virginia, I, I try to be more mindful of it because at least since I was in high school, I, I, I've cared a great deal about human rights and I feel almost as if it's a, it's a moral obligation as much as um, an intellectual curiosity that I have. What bothered me the most in Japan was I saw wealthy Japanese businessmen with young girls probably some of whom were at least there not in their own free will. Um, and that concerned me. And then it also concerned me that there was local organized crime, the Yakuza, who were you know dressed in all black and driving limousines with tinted windows. That bothered me. But what bothered me more than anything else was the police actually had a police box right in the middle of the red light district with a big blue police shield. And you saw the Yakuza and the police talking together, laughing together, being corrupt together. And that showed me that if we really want to fight modern day slavery or any form of, of contemporary slavery, we have to understand that it's a government problem where people are there to make money and they're there to buy and sell human beings because it, it's to their economic benefit. That really shook me up to see that it's at that deep of a level in, in one of the most, you know, apparently civilized countries in the world. Uh, Japan is one of the safest places, and yet, that was where I saw there's one facet of society that is not safe, especially for those, largely those women who are being trafficked against their will. Yeah, um, a year and a half ago, Kevin Bales from Free the Slaves came to give us a guest lecture on human trafficking here at the University of Richmond. And he and I, after his guest lecture, met and we developed a friendship. And I've started doing some informal work with them, just you know, sometimes over uh, the summer here and there on helping them understand more about the, the data they're collecting about slaves in India who've been liberated. But until today, very few people know about 
what happens to people after liberation. They don't know more about the process. So Free the Slaves has actually gone to India and they've begun to actually collect sample surveys on these survivors of, of modern day slavery. And I've actually helped them from time to time in actually looking at the data. The process of liberation is something that happens over time. Let me give you an example. After the emancipation of African Americans here in the United States, people thought that African Americans were free, but they were anything but free. There was a century of institutionalized Jim Crow segregation, racism, to the extent that we could say the emancipation of 1865 was a botched emancipation. Um, so, for example, the work that Free the Slaves is doing in India is looking at communities that have been liberated, quote unquote liberated, but they're taking years to educate themselves, they're taking years to find jobs, so that over time there is this dividend of freedom, but that dividend is taking more than just one day or one single event. So that, that's a bit of a distinction between liberation and actual freedom. Uh, well, unfortunately, if you want to look around the south side in Richmond, Virginia, you can, you can find domestic minor sex trafficking or any large city. Um, and the sad thing is that even here in the United States, one of the greatest countries in the world, the most powerful nation in the history of the world, we still have in the United States a lot of people who are still prone to, to being bought and sold. Here in the U.S., it's mainly sex trafficking, although that's not necessarily the case around, around the world, like in Brazil, where it's more of men being um, forced in labor to burn charcoal, which goes in the steel of the cars that we drive and the appliances that we use, um, or in Nepal, where it's children making bricks, or in northern India, where it's children weaving carpets with their delicate fingers until they start bleeding. Um, but here in the United States, it's largely sex trafficking. Um, a very tragic example is what we see every Super, Super Bowl Sunday. It's the most uh, popular sporting event of the year. This year's Super Bowl Sunday was in New Orleans, and it's the perfect, perfect breeding ground for sex trafficking, even for domestic minor sex trafficking, because you have tens of thousands of men, tens of thousands of men who've got access to money, fistfuls of cash, pocketfuls of cash, and tens of thousands of men who want to get drunk and have a good time. Prostitution is something that follows the law of supply and demand, and the economics of slavery is no different, where people who want to have a good time on Super Bowl Sunday will pay for sex, and knowing that pimps, gangs, organized crime will flock there and so, tragically, Super Bowl Sunday is the largest sex trafficking event of the year, every year in the United States. And you might associate that with pizza and mom and apple pie and the American dream, but not for those young girls being trafficked. So if you look closely, it's right in front of us. If you look closely, it's right before your eyes, but sometimes it takes awareness or education to do that, which is hopefully a little bit of what the classes that we're offering here in Human Rights at the University of Richmond will do. Unfortunately, I've seen on the local level here in Richmond, the national level in Washington, D.C., and the international level, human ego getting in the way of cooperation and sharing information. And I think there's something about the subject of human trafficking that lights up people in a deeply emotional way where they feel so deeply invested in their particular beliefs that they won't work together. I think that's enormously tragic and I'm seeing that more and more in the contemporary anti-slavery movement. So my message for any organization at the University of Richmond is to one, be cooperative, share information, share resources, share ideas, and two, be okay with the fact that you can't do everything by yourself. Be okay with the fact that you have to work together to truly have success. 
if people did that more locally and nationally and globally, I think we'd be even farther along in the anti-slavery movement than we are today. So we've got to manage our egos. We've got to manage um, our, our attitudes and, and check those things. And, and then I think we'll be fine. You know, I, I think that the best thing about the anti-slavery movement or fighting modern day slavery is, by and large, the people that you meet on a one-on-one -on -one basis are very heartfelt, very gracious. There's a, a survivor of domestic minor sex trafficking with whom I've become friends here in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, she's becoming quite known now nationally. Her name is Holly Austin Smith. And it, it's very rewarding to work with people who want to end slavery. It, it feels better than anything else that I've done. It gives me inspiration, it gives me motivation, it gives me a purpose that feels larger than myself. And so although the subject matter might be dark, it feels so good to be able to shine a light on it in a way that can one day help help in slavery. And, and it's only by shining that light that we can do this. So I'm, I'm glad to be holding one of those candles up. You know, it's begun to gain some traction where when people through movies like Taken, starring Liam Neeson, or through MTV's exit campaign, people are becoming familiar, at least with sex trafficking, but they may not be familiar with uh, domestic servitude, for instance, here in the United States, in which more often than not, every major city in the United States will have from time to time some publicized incident of some wealthy family employing somebody who was there, uh, legally speaking, with the right documentation, but who wasn't being paid for their service, who was being kept lock and key against their will. Those types of stories are what you might hear from time to time, but I think there's something in the national imagination that has yet to fully internalize the fact that we still have slavery here today in the United States. It doesn't make sense with what we understand slavery to be. Here in the United States, when we think about slavery, it's usually African Americans who were bought and sold 200 years ago. So I think education, awareness, are, are things that we can do to begin pushing that conversation beyond just sex trafficking, which people are beginning to become familiar with, but forced labor, bonded labor, forced marriage, those are other types of contemporary slavery that I think we just frankly need more education about at this stage before we can take things to the next level. The classes that we're allowed to create at the University of Richmond are very, very open as long as they, one, fill the interest of students on an intellectual basis, and two, that they overlap with our interests. So a perfect example is the sophomore scholars in residence class that I'm teaching this fall that will be for the 2013-2014 academic year. And that will be on the subject of human rights and modern day slavery. And this will be, I think, really the first piece of, of intellectual fruit that creating a new class uh, will, will basically see. It will be the first time that I've offered a class in human rights. It won't be the last. Um, and another class that I'm offering this fall is a senior seminar in human rights in which I'll focus not just on issues of trafficking, but also issues of gay marriage, of civil unions, the debate over the death penalty, uh, among other issues. But I, I see this as really the beginning of, of more classes that I'm not just offering, but also classes that my colleagues in anthropology are offering, in the School of Business are offering, um, in, in a way that I think all of us are finally beginning to realize that there is student demand, that we care about this interest, and we want to meet student demand, and so we're actually beginning to form a very loose-based coalition of faculty members and staff and students who want to focus on human rights so that no one person is responsible for everything, or no one student group is responsible for everything. We want to try to fashion and foster a community that is largely sustainable, so that it's not just me, it's me and Dr. French, and that's not just me and Dr. French, but also Dr. Urkelwater, Dr. Literal, Dr. Thekdi, and, and it's really been over the, only the past few months that we've begun to actually have this conversation 
as members of the University of Richmond that a year ago people hadn't even begun to discuss. We had been thinking about it, but we're, we're almost, I'd say, at a renaissance of human rights, not just culturally and nationally, but also academically. And, and I think this fall will begin to produce the first fruits of that, but by far not the last. This is just the beginning of the harvest. I'm not going to come up for air for a long time. This is going to be an issue that's going to be with me until I'm old and gray because it's something that I know is going to devote a lot of the rest of my life. But I, I feel really good about that because it feels right. I feel as if my intellectual interests are in alignment with my values, even with my spiritual interests. Um, so I, I feel as if I, I'm at the beginning of, of a great adventure that will involve not just me, but students, my coworkers, faculty, hopefully people in the community, not just in Richmond, but nationally and even internationally. I, I see this as becoming much bigger than just me, but I'm very, very thankful to be, be on this journey now that I have the, the timing and the resources all ready to go to focus on human rights.